Okay, so uh, welcome to the second day of the workshop. I hope you are enjoying uh, the hands-on sessions. Uh, my name is Nuria Carasayas Barris and I'll be sharing uh, the next two lectures. So the first one is about um, atmospheric interpretation from cross collation maps. And the second one is about the petit red trends. Uh, first of all, I would like to remind you that if you have questions during the lectures, feel, please feel free uh, to raise your hand or to write the questions in the chat. And please do not use the Slack channel during the lectures because we will not monitor it. And after the lectures, you can continue the discussion in the dedicated Slack channel for that particular lecture. And remember to add the name of the speaker uh, when you ask the question. And finally, that the, the lectures are recorded. So they will be uploaded, uh, they will be available on, on YouTube afterwards. So with this said, we can move on and start the first lecture by Chloe and Sid. So please uh, feel free to share the screen. Yep, let me just share screen. And then end up full screen. Okay, so. For uh, those of you who don't know me, hi, uh, my name is Sid. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, atmospheric interpretation from cross correlation maps or retrievals with high resolution uh, spectra. Now, this is quite a complex uh, topic. So, uh, unfortunately, this is going to be more of a, a talk than a hands on thing. There will be some hands on stuff, particularly when we start comparing line lists. Uh, and I'll show you some demonstrations of. Uh, Cross correlation, etc. But this is going to be a uh, more of a talk style thing. After about forty minutes, I'm going to hand over to Chloe, who will then talk about machine learning with high resolution, and then go through some examples, including uh, random forest retrievals on low res spectra. Uh, yeah, this will be about forty minutes uh, into it. Um, now, many of the things that I'm going to talk about today have been discussed in detail or will be discussed in detail during the course of the week. So, for instance, some of the data analysis uh, Matteo and Jens uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, Matteo and uh, Neil Gibson are going to be talking about cross correlation to log likelihoods uh, and high resolution cross correlation spectroscopy and getting abundances out. Uh, and after this talk, we'll also have uh, details on petite rad trans, on how to model these spectra, on how to do retrievals of low res, uh, just following mine and Chloe's talk. Uh, and then finally, on the line lists, Katie Chubb will probably go into much more detail than I will uh, on all of the species and all of the line lists, etc. later on this week. So really, this talk is going to be more of a, a top level approach on the aspects that you need. Uh, uh, the differences between low resolution and high resolution retrievals and things that you really need to be aware of. Um, and because it's more of a talk heavy thing, uh, I will put the slides on Slack after the, uh, the talks are done, just so you have something to refer back to if you need. Uh, and then the slides also are a little bit text heavy, just because if you're referring back to it, you want all the information. Um, So uh, just very quickly on the differences between low and high res. Uh, by low, re low, low resolution, I, I generally mean um, observations where detections and constraints are from broadband molecular absorption or atomic absorption features. So in this case, you can see this here, broadband feature from water in the HST band in the emission spectrum of HD209. Uh, whereas for high res, we're, what we're really looking at is the individual lines that make up those absorption bands. And so here you can see the zoom in of the 2.3 micron K band, uh, where CryRes took the observations, uh, showing a model with CO and water, and you can very clearly see these individual CO lines in the spectrum. And that's really what we're kind of correlating. Uh, to, to detect these species. Now with low res, we've seen retrievals have been, have been done over, over a decade. Uh, and the way we do that is basically we explore millions of models, explore the entire kind of parameter space 
uh, over temperature, over chemical abundances, over cloud properties, etc. And you generate various spectra and you see how well they fit the data and then you use some kind of Bayesian analysis uh, or like statistical uh, fitting tool to kind of get kind of a constraint essentially on the spectrum uh, from your data and its error. And then from that, you also have constraints on the various parameters that go into your retrieval, say for instance, water abundance. And then that will also allow you to extract, say, detection significances. So you can say, you know, not only do I detect this water, but I detect it at this significance. I have an abundance in my atmosphere of this. And it's going to all just be done by extracting the information that's available in the spectrum. And what we want to do is something similar with high resolution spectra. Now, as I said, there are differences between the two. So, uh, low res, for instance, retains continuum information quite well just because you're convolving over a much wider uh, Gaussian. Uh, and you can clearly see the features. I mean, you might not know that this feature is from water, but it's very clear in the HST band that there is something here. Um, however, you can get degeneracies between species at low res. And that's because when you're probing such a, a wide band, you know, the, the absorption can occur from not just water, but from a number of other species like methane, HCN, C2H2, et cetera, you know, all kinds of species that have absorption, say, at the 1.5, 1.6 micron. Um, and you're generally sensitive to a, a narrow range of pressures because of the resolution. High res is almost entirely flipped. Your, you, you can avoid the degeneracy between the species because you have many, many thousands of lines that you're correlating. So they're not going to be all the same for different species. You can even tell between different isotopes of different species with high res. Um, and you generally probe a wider range of altitude. You're actually probing a bit higher up in the atmosphere because the line cores are generated at higher altitudes. So you can sometimes end up probing, you know, four or five decks in pressure with these high res spectra. Um, and as we've seen, uh, it can be difficult to extract the planetary signal due to the noise, but from Matera Nien's talk yesterday, we know, we have some idea of, of, of the process that we do to kind of extract that signal and, and, and preserve it as much as we can. So here is a very rough flow chart of a retrieval. Now I'm not going to go into the gory details, but here is basically all the stuff that you need in order to make it. So first of all, you start off with a load of parameters that describe your atmosphere. Say for instance, temperature or temperature gradient or chemical abundance of water, etc. cloud depth pressure. And they go to make your atmospheric profile. And then you take the abundances and the profile and you generate the opacity of the atmosphere. And this is where the line lists of each species come in. And then you generate a model spectrum, whether that be in emission or in transmission, various geometries. Um, and then one of the most important things that we need for high res, which isn't really too much of a worry at low res, is the model reprocessing, which is that whatever we do to the data at high res to extract the planetary signal and clean it up, we have to make sure that we do the same thing to the model because it, it will modify the planetary signal as I'll, as I'll show later. And then eventually you have your model and your data product and you combine them in order to get a likelihood value. And then you put that to your Bayesian analysis and that kind of goes around in a loop many, many millions of times until it converges to something that hopefully makes sense. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is the line lists and the opacity considerations that we need for high resolution. Now, because you're generating a spectrum at R of 100,000, you've got to make sure that those line lists are also there or thereabouts at that kind of accuracy. So here you can see it, an infrared uh, between one and five micron, uh, various organic volatile species, opacities. They kind of go up and down, but generally, you know, there is some region where each of them has like a dominant opacity. Most of my talk is going to be focused on the infrared, but everything I say is also applicable to the optical with refractory species and atomic species as well. Um, 
And the choice of line list can actually make a big difference as to whether we detect a species or even get biased abundances out. And that's because say you're cross-correlating between a thousand of these lines in your data. If your line list is only able to capture say 200 or 500 of them, then you're, you lose that fraction of the signal that you're trying to correlate with. So if you only got 200 lines that are actually correctly placed in your uh, model in your line list, for instance, you get basically five times lower signal out. So it's really important that we, that we get these right. And there's been huge work done in the last few years to do that. Um, and then we also, depending on the various likelihood methods that we use, uh, you can also be sensitive to the line profile. So the pressure broadening, the thermal broadening is all really important to get right. Uh, just very quickly, how do we actually calculate the cross section um, of a species? So you, these line list databases, databases basically give you a load of transitions and their transition strengths. And you can work out for each temperature what that transition strength is. And then for each of those transitions, for each of those lines, um, you're going to have to broaden the profile according to the pressure and the temperature. Uh, so the pressure broadening uh, is given by Lorentzian profile. Uh, and that's given by something that depends on the quantum numbers of each of the lines, the J quantum numbers. Um, and then it also depends on the medium, the, 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 whether you're in an H2 rich atmosphere, whether you're in air. So it's really important that we kind of get these right because the, the parameters can actually vary quite a lot uh, depending on them. Uh, and there's one thing I haven't talked about, which is uh, natural broadening that can also come in, which also results in a, a Lorentzian profile. Uh, another thing that you can get is the temperature. So when you have a gas at a certain temperature that has a velocity distribution for the gas, and so some molecules at some point will be coming towards you, some will be going away. And so the line will basically be shifted and it'll be shifted according to the velocity profile, which is a Gaussian. Uh, so you have this thermal broadening, which is the Gaussian, you have this pressure broadening, which is Lorentzian, and then you can involve the two to get the overall line broadening for every single line in your, in your line list. Uh, and that's, that's what is a Voigt profile. So for each of these lines, we need to basically apply a Voigt profile to it, sum them all up uh, to get the overall opacity, uh, overall cross-section, sorry. Uh, and then from that cross-section, you can then work out the opacity by kind of timing by the, um, the mixing fraction and then um, number density, et cetera, to, to, to get the total value. And then that's what's used in your radiative transfer. Now, they... Line lists are really important because the choice can actually significantly alter the spectrum. So here you're seeing an example from Brogian line 2019, uh, which shows two different water line lists, the Patrick and Swenke and the BT2 line list. And you can see that at high res in the K-band, there's actually quite significant differences between the two, even for these strong lines. You can see here there's differences. And if you generate a model, a synthetic data spectrum, uh, synthetic spectrum with the Patrick and Swenke line list and then retrieve with the same Patrick and Swenke line list, you end up getting pretty good abundances out for water. It's where it should be. The CO is where it should be and the planet's velocity profile is in the right location. But if you generate your model with a Patrick and Schwenke and then retrieve with the BT2 line list, a different water line list, you can end up biasing your abundance because effectively it's trying to look for a match for that line list in your spectrum that isn't quite there. So obviously the abundance is lower because there's fewer lines that actually match that. Um, and that actually has a very significant effect on not just the water abundance, but also on other species and other parameters. So here you can see the velocity is now shifted as well. And that might be a result of the fact that the lines are overall just shifted slightly one way or another in a line list, for instance. And also you're losing now the CO signal from where it should be. And the CO line list we haven't touched, that's the same. And the reason for that is because when you reduce the water abundance, you also reduce the continuum opacity. And so then the lines that 
for the CEO that were kind of, say, a certain strength now are too strong for what they should be. So they have to kind of reduce their abundance to, to match. And so, you know, you, you choose the wrong line list for water and it ends up biasing basically everything. So it's really important that we get these right. Uh, and in the last few years, there's been loads of work by databases like Exomol and HITEM um, that often use a combination of theoretical, you know, the completeness of the line list relying on theoretical computation uh, and then empirically kind of experimentally measured lines to kind of correct their positions to make them really, really accurate uh, at high temperatures, which is what we need for our work. Um, so here are just some of the some of the recent line lists for these uh, six species that I was talking about earlier. CO, CO2, water, they're pretty good. So this is generated at 1000 Kelvin. Um, and you can see that they agree pretty well. Some of these weaker lines uh, do show some differences, but generally we're okay. Um, but there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years, very, uh, very recently, on larger molecules like ammonia, methane, C2H2, which have much more complex, much bigger line lists to try and really get them to the accuracy that we need um, and the completeness that we need, really. Uh, for our applications for high res. So here you can see that the high temp 2010 and the uh, pokers at tell line list from Eximal, they agree pretty well. There are some differences uh, and they generally kind of get bigger as you go towards higher temperature, um, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, we also tested methane and the new methane line list because that does have quite big differences between high tran and high temp. And we tried to look for the signal of methane in HD 102.195. And sadly, with the new high temp line list, uh, the signal almost completely went away. So there's really no evidence for, there's no significant evidence for CH4 using this high temp line list. And the reason for that is because they're just so different. And you can see the differences just by eye, like the high temp is just much more complete, has a much higher continuum there's loads of these weak lines that kind of just join together to really just raise up the opacity. These, these um, uh, strong lines are actually pretty okay with high temp and high trend, but it is weak lines that really come into it. And then again, higher the temperature, the bigger the, um, the, the effect is there. Uh, here I can just switch to... the collab where I put the pokers at L and the high temp line list uh, for water and then the high temp and high tran line list for methane just so you can have a have a play around with them I'm just going to very quickly show you uh, let's plot 400 Kelvin uh, and then let's look at water at 400 Kelvin between the two, you can see that they agree pretty well. There are some small differences, but we're really capturing the behavior quite nicely. When we start getting towards higher temperatures, say 1000 Kelvin, then you'll start seeing a few more differences. And then as we get towards even higher, uh, you'll see much, much bigger differences, although still, you know, the, the tops, the strongest lines agree quite well. Um, when we try the same thing with the high tran line list and high temp line list for methane, what you'll see is a much bigger difference between the two. So here I'm going to plot the methane and you can see just how much the high temp line list contributes to the continuum. There's just many more lines that, that, uh, that contribute there. So let me just go back to the talk. We have one question, Sid, in the chat. Yeah. Uh, this is Dion, which asks, uh, what causes this, these differences between line list? Is it different assumptions, data sets, something else? Uh, so. It depends on it depends on a, a, a many factors. I think is is the easiest way to say it. So you can have you can generate a line list using a purely theoretical approach, say, 
where you model the Hamiltonian, you have all of the energy levels, and then you just calculate the transitions between them. Or you can do what Hytran do at low temperature, which is mostly experimental verification. You know, they have a big tube of gas, and then they kind of just measure the lines where they are at room temperature. Um, the hard part, though, is that you can't really do this kind of high temperature measurement for some of these species, like HCN, for instance, which is a toxic gas. And imagine just heating a gas up to over a thousand degrees. That's just a recipe for disaster, really. So it's very difficult to get these measurements experimentally. So we kind of have to use a combination, you know, wherever it's possible at these kind of intermediate temperatures, they probably measure these, um, uh, these lines, the strongest lines, um, or they might do it for a low pressure measurement um, and then kind of just kind of piece it together. So what you do is you get these measurements from the lab and you kind of just change your Hamiltonian uh, according to what the states are. Like, so there'll be slight differences. You change your energy levels and where they are located and the like gaps between them. And that will obviously change the, the line positions because you're changing the frequency of the lines. Um, but it's all, it's a, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole science in itself. So I can't really do it too much justice here. Um, but yeah, just suffice it to say, there's been a lot of work in trying to get these high temperature, high resolution line lists. Uh, and you can see that if we generate a spectrum with these two different high temp and high trans methane line lists, uh, we only get an overall correlation between the spectra, the actual model spectra, the, the um, FPRF staff in this case, uh, of 55%. And that's because 45% of the contribution is actually coming from these much weaker lines, which just add up um, just because there's so many, so many of them. Um, uh, this was this spectrum was generated, I believe, at around a thousand Kelvin. If you reduce the temperature to about eight hundred Kelvin, you get better agreement. So the overall correlation between high temp and high trend goes to, I think, about 0.62, if I remember correctly. Um, so it shows that you know lower temperature, better agreement because it's easy to measure things at room temperature, like in a lab. Um, where it's much harder at higher temperatures to, to, to get that because there's many more lines that come into it as well. And you can see that actually the, this is not a shifted away in one direction or the other. So effectively it's, it's aligned, it's just incomplete in this case. So you can see that this is the, there's no net shift in the high tran and high temp line list. They're all kind of on top of each other where they are in agreement. So that was, um, that was for HD102, uh, but methane has also been detected in HD209, and this was using the high temp line list, which came out last year. Um, this was uh, using four nights of Giano data on the TNG. This uh, covered the H and K bands, a little bit of the J band as well. So going from about 0.95 to about two and a half, 2.6 micron. Um, where there's prominent opacity from methane in, in H and K. Uh, now, we, we also tried this with the Hytran line list, and the signal was much weaker. So here we got a significance of 5.6 with the high temp. We try it with Hytran because there's fewer lines and because you only have, you know, about 50% of the correlation in the spectrum, the, the detection significance did drop to 3.7, which is consistent with kind of what we'd expect. So I've discussed the line lists and the opacities. Um, got to make sure we get them right. Once we have them, we generate our model spectrum. The next thing is uh, how, to, how do we actually convert that model spectrum that we have into something like the high-res data? Uh, how do we pro reprocess the model? How do we analyze the data? Um, this is something that was covered in uh, Jens and Mateo's talk yesterday. Uh, but the things to bear in mind is that there are many, many things that are much stronger than your planet in the data, in the observations that you get from high res. The stellar signal, for instance, if you're if you're measuring emission, you get uh, FP plus F star and you kind of using because of the fact that the planet will Doppler shift, you kind of can remove the stellar 
signal, uh, as we were seeing yesterday. And then telluric absorption features from water, methane, CO2 will also contribute, as well as air mass variation. You can see that here in, for instance, this step three of this process, you can see that they start off quite dark and they get brighter and then get darker again as the air mass kind of gets goes down and then goes back up. Um, and really what we need to do is remove all of these from the observations. And this is done through various, various methods, masking, SVD, CISREM, et cetera. Um, and then, and then removing this can also affect the plant tree signal because if you apply something like PCA, it kind of just applies it blindly without just saying, okay, well, I know that this is the planet and I know this is the star, I'm just gonna get rid of this. You kind of affect the whole data set. You, you don't remove much of the planet, but you can remove some of the signal and you can introduce some, some, some artifacts. Uh, so it's really important that we, whatever we do to the data to kind of analyze it, to kind of, extract the planet signal we also do to the model uh, in order to effectively match the observations. Um, so here, for instance, is a step-by-step -step process from uh, Matteo and Mike Klein's paper uh, on how they do this. First, you inject the model. So here is our spectrum that we want to create basically a, a data set with to compare with the actual data. You shift the model according to the KP and the VSIS, and that results in these lines here that kind of move down that are Doppler shifted as the observation goes. And then you have the uh, telluric air mass and instrumental effects that are introduced on top of that. Uh, and then you calibrate that with the wavelengths and you calibrate the wavelengths usually using the telluric lines. Uh, and then finally, this is what you end up with. And then, and then uh, you can remove uh, those effects as the data analysis does to kind of effectively match your model with the data. So you average and uh, uh, in time, and then you fit the mean, and then you remove the temporal variability. Uh, and then finally, you end up with something that looks something like this. Now your model is in there, it's just buried in the noise because the noise is significantly stronger than your planet signal, but it is there. If you look at it, a noiseless case, you can actually see this here. And that's very different to step two, which is what we started with. So all of these different effects, once you start removing them through say principal component analysis, et cetera, you, you end up diminishing your planet spectrum and introducing these kind of artifacts that kind of go the other way. So it's really important that we match them. And this is what uh, Matteo and Yen's talk was all about, uh, about really getting the analysis right and making sure you match that with the model that you're comparing with. So once we have a, uh, a reprocessed model, the final step is getting out a likelihood value from them. Now, historically, detections with high res have been done using, um, using cross correlation. So this is where you compare your model, you kind of push one against the other and you can detect your species through that. So CO, H2O, HCN, and in this case, CH4 sadly wasn't seen in one or two, but we did see it in uh, HD209. Um, so you can detect various species, you're very sensitive to that, but uh, we're not really, we haven't really explored say the different abundances that could be present, uh, the different thermal profiles, et cetera, that you would do in a normal retrieval. Uh, so cross-correlation, which is a technique that we use to detect these species, uh, is something that looks a bit like this. Now I can demonstrate what cross-correlation is effectively doing uh, through this little GIF here. So in blue, you have your data. In this case, your signal to noise is about five times bigger than... Um, so your signal is about five times bigger than your noise. Uh, and then what you do is your orange model, which is uh, the spectrum that you're trying to correlate with, just kind of pass that along and where it matches, where all the lines line up, et cetera. Um, you, you get a very strong peak out. Uh, now this is, this is very simplistic. You know, th this is probably the kind of noise that we might get for a hot Jupiter from ELT, uh, but, 
currently we, we probably have something that looks a bit more like this, where the signal to noise is about 0.8 um, or even less uh, in some cases. So, you know, you, you, your planet signal is buried in the noise, but this cross correlation can still extract that signal quite nicely, as you can see here. Just because on average, you know, the noise will kind of over those thousands of data points, thousands of lines will just average to zero, whereas the spectrum will not. I'm just going to go back to the talk. So this is the product that we're applying, but uh, to think about it uh, in terms of, in terms of like, visualizing, just imagine one you're sliding through the other. And a well-matched model will result in a cross-correlation value of one. Uh, and a poorly matched model will result in something that's very close to zero because you're not matching anything. Uh, now, this very easily allows us to determine which models uh, match the observations quite nicely. But you remove any kind of scaling in the model. So you could have, say, a spectrum with 1,000 times more CO or a thousand times more water and it wouldn't modify the spectrum or you could even stretch the spectrum uh, by a certain value and because you normalize that uh, you, you basically remove that information uh, and this is something that we really need to keep if we want to do a, a, a Bayesian analysis with this. So at low res what we use is the is the chi-squared value uh in our retrievals and that's very easy to do you have your data and you have your model data points uh, and you have the error bar and you can just calculate that very easily what we need basically is a way to convert our cross correlation value or something very similar to it uh, into a likelihood that we can use for high resolution now i'm going to briefly discuss three ways to do this um the zucker method which was originally used for i believe stellar rvs uh, the second method, which is the Brogian line approach, and the third one, which is uh, Neil Gibson's 2020 uh, approach. So the Zucker approach, it's simple, it's easy. Uh, it's just log of one minus the cross correlation value squared. Um, now, a well-matched model will result in C squared going towards one, which means your value will go towards a very large and very positive value for log L and a very poorly matched model will result in log L is very close to zero. Um, however, this has the downside that anti-correlation cannot be distinguished because you have a C squared value. It means that say you have a thermal inversion in your atmosphere, then your emission features may not get correlated with absorption features because you lose that sign. So what we really want is something that is is keeping that sign effectively. And we're still also invariant of the scale of the model in this case, because again, we're just using the straightforward cross correlation value. So uh, an extension to this would be to define your log L in terms of that, the, the data given by G and the model given by F. So slightly different. Now a well-matched model, uh, and variance as well uh, will result in a log L that's large and positive, and a poorly matched model or variance will be penalized. Uh, and now we do include this uh, uh, dependence on the variance, and we are also sensitive to the sign of the correlation through this term here, F, F times G. However, we don't include any wavelength dependent noise in this case. So one extension of that would be to use the Gibson approach where we do include uh, wavelength dependent noise um, and that, that has very similar behavior uh, and high uncertainty terms and noisy parts of the spectrum are gonna be naturally penalized because you divide through by the signal. Um, so now we do include the wavelength dependent and it allows for a scaling in the noise structure as well. Um, and you may, you may also, depending on how you parameterize this in your retrieval, you might also have an additional parameter here, a beta, uh, to account for this noise scaling. Uh, here I'm just using the um, maximum likelihood estimator on beta. So you kind of remove that, that value out here. 
there's various approaches that we can do in order to get out the likelihood and then kind of plug that in to our Bayesian analysis. And now we, we have something that's basically complete so that we can construct a retrieval for high resolution spectra uh, in that way. But uh, there are some other modeling considerations that we need to consider, that, that we need to be aware of. You know, First of all, you're generating a spectrum R of 100,000 as opposed to with HSC or JWST data. So you're looking at about 10 to 100 times more kind of lines. So you're, you're going to have to computationally just be aware of that. Um, and nowadays, new spectrographs like Giano, like Spiru, they cover you know, a big chunk of wavelength going from 0.9 to 2.6 microns. So you're going to have to generate a spectrum of that entire range at very high resolution, which is computationally very intensive. Um, and also you got to remember that because you're probing a much wider range of altitudes, the number of atmospheric layers may also come into it. You know, you've got to make sure that you don't use a really coarse uh, parameterization in your, in your uh, PT grid. Uh, otherwise, you can end up kind of end up with kind of skewed results slightly. Um, because the biggest advantage that this gives is that we can combine low res and high res observations very easily um, by just adding up their log likelihoods or times in them uh, in, in not log space. Um, now, this does combine the advantage of both approaches, as we were seeing before, you know, they were complementary in many ways. See, may I interrupt? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think it's just a test. Give me a minute. Okay. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm going to burn Perfect that. time to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there is a question by Jens. And yep. the question is uh, about the likelihood methods that you just presented. Yep. Uh, why should we convert from C to L using some assumed uh, formula? And why can't we just compute L from the get go? The, the get go. I mean, why can't we compute L from like, you know, you had a formula for L two yep. three slides back. Yeah. Why can't you just uh, this. this one? Why can't you just fill it in? Like, why do you need to have a cross correlation? You can, uh, yeah, that is, that is an approach that you can also take. Um, I believe that's very similar to the, to the Gibson et al approach, um, but he would probably know more about this than I do. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, you can cut out the, cut out the middleman of the cross correlation and just go straight to that. Um, you do need some kind of, some kind of measure on the, on the noise profile, I guess. Well, yeah, that's like your sigma i, and you have that. I get. I mean, supposedly. Uh. Yeah. So, so you know, theoretically, that that is something you can you can do uh, without too much that too much problem. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, what was that? There. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can combine the advantages of, of both approaches, I guess. Um, and then it also allows for robust detection because say you're seeing something at two, three sigma at low res or even at high res, you want to make sure that the result is kind of as it should be, you know, oh, am I actually seeing the species or not? Then combining the data sets will allow a completely almost independent measure of whether, you know, am I seeing water? Am I seeing CO, et cetera? Uh, and it will also increase the detection significance if they are combining together because your overall, your log L will go up. Um, and this also allows us to compare the differences between each. Now, if you say high res is probing slightly higher up on the altitude, in altitude than low res, and you see some differences, can those be attributed to vertical differences in the atmosphere? You know, are you probing different altitudes and the abundances or the temperature profile or whatever? Has, has it changed because of that? And what does that tell you? So it gives us a lot of information and gives a lot of advantages to combine them. Um, and the procedure to combine them is essentially, you, you split the process into two and, and what we've been doing all for high res, it's very easy to just do the same thing for low res. 
uh, and then you just add up the likelihoods at the end. Sorry, add up the log likelihoods at the end. And we tested this uh, using HST Spitzer and then uh, CryRes VLT observations on HD209, uh, and then used the, the Brogian line method to map the cross correlation to the, to the likelihood. Uh, and the abundance constraints that you get for water and CO are basically what you'd expect. They, they you know, they, they decrease, they get tighter um, as we have the hybrid retrieval, as we combine the two. So let's take water to start with. You're starting off. So in the K-band, there isn't much of a, a water opacity. So the high res data has probably the weakest constraints. Uh, and then the low res you're constraining from the HST uh, with C3. Combining the two, you get a much tighter constraint between the two. Uh, and then the CO, you get the same thing. The CO is actually much stronger, uh, much more strongly detected in the K-band um, than in the, in this case, it'd be the Spitzer points. <laughs> Um, and then actually combining it results in a much tighter constraint that you wouldn't even expect. Um, and that's really uh, because of the fact that when you combine the retrievals, the temperature profile is much more tightly constrained from the low res side. Now, when you constrain your temperature profile much more tightly, you are also constraining the CO abundance much more tightly. So they kind of, it's doing better than you would expect because there's other parameters that are better constrained. And this obviously gives us much better uh, constraints on, on other parameters that we want to calculate from that, like the C2O ratio, the metallicity, and if you want to explore formation, et cetera. So finally, to conclude, uh, I've just gone through the things that you need to be aware of if you're trying to uh, do a high resolution retrieval, talked about the opacities and the line lists that we need to be aware of talked about the data analysis, Jens and Matteo really went through that in detail uh, last night. Uh, and there's also various ways of converting between CC to log L, or as Jens was saying, you know, just to go straight to the log L. Um, and these will hopefully allow for more simultaneous retrievals of low, low res and high res in, uh, in future. So thanks for listening. And if there aren't any questions, we can move to Chloe's talk. There is one question yeah. by Ever. Uh, do you have any sort of waiting, waiting on the likelihoods between the high and low resolution parts of the hybrid retrieval? Otherwise, wouldn't the likelihood be dominated by the high resolution component simply because of the large number of data points? Uh, well, it's automatically in a way weighted. So if it's if it's data that isn't quite if, it, if the data isn't very good, then, you know, the differences between models will not result in a much, much of a difference between uh, likelihood values. So it, it, it almost automatically weights itself. Um, generally, I think that the, the low res tends to be better at constraining water and then the high res better at constraining things like CO, because in this case, we're just looking at the CO but you don't need to wait them. It kind of automatically does that by this, this approach, say, for instance, here, where you're dividing through by the error um, and you're dividing through by the variance here in this case. So it kind of automatically takes that into account in, in each of the individual ones. So you can just combine them, um, if that makes sense. Sorry, can I add something to this? Because this is, I think, a crucial, a crucial point. Um, maybe uh, so. So just, just one minute. Um, it's true. You might get a value from the likelihood of the high res, which is like um, ten million, and you might get a value that is only fifty from the likelihood of the low res point. So, a face value, you might think, okay, ten million over fifty, it dominates. But what you do when you do model comparison or parameter estimates is to calculate the difference in the from between the maximum likelihood and any other values of likelihood. So it's really just the increase 
above this threshold of 10 million or above this threshold of 50 that you are uh, that you're interested in so it doesn't matter if you have a million data points that lead you to an increase of five or you have uh, only 50 data points that lead, lead you uh, to an increase of, uh, of five this is called uh, this is like likelihood ratio tests so the number of data points disappears you're just left over with the number of parameters so if you apply the same model into the low rest and the high rest data number of parameters is the same so you are comparing apples with apples there's no there's no problem there uh, you're just starting by how much the likelihood changes compared to the baseline value you don't care about what the baseline value of the likelihood is um, it could be 50 could be 50 million uh, you don't really care thank you okay cool so uh, i'm just going to stop sharing and then uh, hand over to chloe who's going to talk about machine learning Cool, thanks, Ed. Um, okay. Okay, can you see the screen? I guess. I hope. <laughs> okay. Yes. yes. So um, this talk is a little bit of a mashup between general machine learning retrievals and also um, this CCF stuff that we were talking about um, with Sid. Um, so, unfortunately, as Sid said, it's quite tricky to do this as a collab because um, a lot of it can take a very long time to run, especially when you're using these high resolution models. Um, so, I have made a collab which I put in the Slack, which is it just runs through how to do um, a low resolution retrieval using the random forest, um, which I talk about later. And then you can kind of generalize that. Um, to the high resolution stuff, but hopefully it'll become clear later. And maybe if we have time, I can kind of skim over the collab. Okay, so the goal um, that we're usually doing, just like very brief recap, um, is to go from these transmission spectra that we usually obtain from um, exoplanets when they pass in front of the star between you, the observer and the star. And in the low resolution case, you get something that looks like the plot on the right. So um, this is a, I think it's a combined spectrum, um, but mostly using HST data, you can see this nice water feature. Um, again, that Sid mentioned in his talk, you can, that's around like 1.4 micron. Um, so these are the typical data points you'd expect to get from space-based telescopes. And then we perform something that we call atmospheric retrieval. So very simply, it runs like this flow chart on the right. So you choose some atmospheric parameters, you feed those into your forward model, and then you use some sampling technique that is gonna check your model against your observations. And then from that, you get posterior distributions of the parameters from your model. So maybe it's like the temperature, the abundances of molecules, the level of a cloud, something like that. And in this sampling step, you usually use um, perhaps a Bayesian method like nested sampling or an MCMC. And you already heard a bit about those yesterday. Okay, so how does machine learning come in? Well, this is kind of trying to replace this sampling step because um, when you run a retrieval, this step can take a long time because each time it draws a new set of parameters, it runs your model again. Um, so you end up running models over and over with uh, different parameter values. Um, and then each time you run a different retrieval, you end up running the same models you already ran before, if that makes sense. So one of the benefits of machine learning is that you pre-compute all these models into what we call a training set. Um, so this is kind of like shifting the computational burden offline because you can reuse the models each time you do a retrieval. You don't need to compute them again and again. Um, and another benefit is that we don't actually need the code that creates the models, we just need the models themselves, um, which can kind of overcome any issues people have with proprietary codes. So maybe you've got a friend on the other side of the world who has this great code, but they spent ages working on it and they don't really wanna just hand it out to everyone, but they're quite happy to give you the models. So with machine learning, you can just take those models and you don't even need the code that generated them. So machine learning retrievals have been going on for a few years. Um, they started 
back in 2015 with Ingo Waldman's work, um, where he uses a neural network to select the molecules that should be in a retrieval. So, you know, when you start from your retrieval, you, you have to decide already which molecules are you going to put in. And Ingo Waldman's neural network can select those automatically for you. Um, then in 2018, our work on random forests came out, which uses um, basically a collection of decision trees to do the sort of sampling step in the retrieval. Um, and I'll talk about that next. Then there's some other methods that use, for example, generative adversarial networks, which are quite complicated, but if you really love machine learning, um, I'd recommend the paper. And also Bayesian neural networks, which work um, kind of in a similar step as the random forest, so they also do that sampling. So a random forest is just a collection of decision trees, or in the case of continuous data, we call them regression trees. And the way they work is actually really straightforward. So if you imagine on the left, you have a transmission spectrum. So let's imagine it's like really low resolution. You've only got two data points. So you've got your blue point and your red point. Now you can represent this entire spectrum as a single point in two dimensional space, which you see on the right. Where in this case, like the X dimension is the transit radius of the blue point. And then the Y dimension is the transit radius of the red point. So you can imagine that um, this generalizes to any number of dimensions. So if you have like 20 data points, it's just a point in 20 dimensional space. Okay, so let's imagine you are trying to um, retrieve temperature from a set of low resolution spectra. So first of all, you've got your training set. Let's imagine this is the training set. So each of the um, each of the numbers represents a spectrum, and let's say that all of the same numbers have the same temperature. So like the ones are really cold spectra, and the fives are really hot spectra. Now the goal of your tree is to try and group these into spectra that have the same temperature, and you've got your dimensions that you saw before, like the blue and the red. So all the tree is going to do is to draw lines across each dimension to split this into the groups. And it does this like automatically and it does it really fast. So it just works through this dividing up the space until you end up with these groups. This is like an idealistic case, obviously, um, where you've got perfectly sorted spectra. So then when you pass it a new spectrum that you ha it hasn't seen before, you simply just send it down the tree and whatever our group that it lands in, which we call leaves, um, that's the temperature that the tree is gonna predict for that spectrum. And there's a different number of different ways you can do that. You can either take, for example, the average of all the temperatures in the leaf, or you could take some distribution of them, or you can just take the whole set of them, which is what we do. So the C values would be the temperature predictions assigned to each leaf. So then when a new one comes in, if it lands in R3, it gets predicted the temperature C3, for example. So that's a single tree. A forest is just a collection of trees um, where basically each tree is like voting for the answer. So you're just basically combining all the votes from the trees, and this will give you a distribution of the parameter values. Um, and the random forest is something called an ABC method. So it's approximate Bayesian computing, which means that because you're not actually using Bayes' theorem, um, it's kind of trying to approximate it. So the posteriors are approximate Bayesian posteriors. Um, and depending on how well you're approximating it, you can see um, how well it compares to like a nested sampling or an MCMC posterior. Okay, so for retrieval of transmission spectra, for example, um, this is the kind of steps you need to go through. So first you choose the parameters you want to retrieve, and then you're going to sample those randomly from their prior ranges. So you just draw some temperature, some abundance of water, etc. And then you use those values to generate your model. Uh, you bin this down to the resolution of the data. And then you add some 
like random Gaussian noise where the standard deviation is going to be the error bar of the noise. And the reason you have to do this is because there's no way of feeding the forest the actual error bars. So you need to build it into the training set so it knows what the noise looks like, if that makes sense. So then you repeat this over and over um, for lots of models. And then you split this into training and testing. Um, so it's important you have a testing set, which is a set of models the forest hasn't seen before. So you compute this only once and it's kind of shifted offline, like I said. So then let's imagine you've trained your forest and then you test it on the set of models it hasn't seen. And this is what you'll get, something like this. So because a single prediction is incredibly fast, it's like microseconds, um, and you can parallelize, parallelize it, um, this allows for what is kind of the equivalent of like thousands of mock retrievals. Um, so you can get the average from each uh, distribution of answers for each parameter. And then you can compare it to the real values because you generated these test spectra. So you know what the real value should be and you can compare um, how the prediction's going. And this gives you the ability to analyze how well the predictions go across the ranges of the parameters, which I think is, is really interesting. And this is really hard to do with a traditional retrieval because obviously you can't run thousands of retrievals, they take ages. <laughs> so um, this is an example of the low resolution retrieval that's in the CoLab. So it's the WASP-12B spectrum from HST. And the model just has temperature, uh, abundances of three molecules and a cloud, uh, just a gray cloud. But if you look at the um, plots here, you can see like the different behaviors of the parameters. So as you get below a certain level, all the molecules kind of level off. So it becomes very hard to predict at really low values, which is quite intuitive. Like you wouldn't expect to be able to tell tiny differences in the abundances apart when there's hardly any of the molecule there. And the other thing you get is um, this behavior here where you see like a flat line and you can see it in HCN quite clearly. So like some of the mod models are lying in the center rather than tracking this red line, which is what you want them to do. And it turns out that these are the models which have a really high cloud. So these are the ones up here. And again, that's quite intuitive because you know that when the cloud level is really high, you're kind of masking out all the molecules it becomes difficult to retrieve the abundances. Okay, so then a single prediction that you do on a real spectrum or just a mock spectrum that you have um, will give you something that looks like this. So it's um, in the top right, you've got the predictions from all of the trees and they just collect into these distributions. Um, and this is the ABC approximate posteriors. Oh yeah, and um, the way that they sort of randomize the trees to make sure there's no like biases um, is that each tree is trained on a slightly different subset of the training set. So that means even if you have some like extreme, um, say like some of your spectra took, took really extreme values of the noise, um, that's not gonna bias the whole forest. Okay, one of the really cool things that you get from the forest is something called the feature importance. So this quantifies the information content for each of the spectral points. So it's basically telling you how important each wavelength point is for determining each parameter. Um, and it's kind of a freebie. So perhaps some of it's really intuitive. You know that the water feature at 1.4 microns is going to tell you a lot about how much water there is in the spectrum. Um, but some things are less intuitive, like which, which spectral points are most important for telling you the temperature. Um, and this kind of thing can be used for uh, telescope proposals, um, which I'm gonna talk about super briefly at the end. Okay, so yeah, like I said, the CoLab is on the Slack channel. Um, it works through the plots that you saw in the last sort of five or six uh, slides, um, but it can be generalized to any kind of retrieval um, and it's also on GitHub if you want to uh, go through the tutorial there, but I think it's actually exactly the same one that's in the code app. Okay, so moving on to high-res data. So this is an example of a zoomed-in spectrum from Harps North. 
um, it's, it's like a model spectrum. So the red was the model that was used to generate the data, which is black points or the gray points, which then get bin to the black points. Um, and this is just a tiny like fraction of the spectrum. So you can see the difference between what the low resolution data looks like and the high resolution data. So this has a huge number of points. Um, I think the full Hobbes null spectrum has like 300,000 points. Um, and I've put this as a high level of noise. It's only a high level of noise per spectral point. So obviously you could kind of bin this down to really low resolution and your, your noise reduces, but then you're losing the information that you want, which is those spectral lines that Sid talked about. Okay, so um, when we started working on this, we wanted to look at uh, KELT 9B, which Jens mentioned yesterday, um, an ultra hot Jupiter where he detected iron and titanium. So our question was, could we retrieve some atmospheric parameters from this spectrum? You know, not only doing these detections, but can we learn about the temperature and metallicity from this arsenal spectrum using the Ren forest? So uh, we went through all the steps. We created these really high resolution models. Um, we trained the forest on them in lots of different ways, uh, taking like different sections of them, taking um, certain lines, et cetera. And um, in the end, this is what we got. So basically not a very good result. Um, it turned out that using the forest directly on the spectra uh, doesn't work because the forest can't determine um, what's going on across the whole thing. It has to look at the individual points and because you have so much noise per spectral point, it couldn't really find the spectrum in there. Um, so that's where the cross correlation comes in because like you heard yesterday, the cross correlation and also today is really great at like seeking out um, the model inside all that noise or seeking out the, the um, spectral lines. Uh, so you already saw one of these. This is just a example of how a cross correlation works. Um, I don't think Jens mentioned this yesterday, but um, if you're like really, really new to all this stuff and you're kind of a bit overwhelmed, which is very understandable, um, Jens has a really cool YouTube video where he just like talks about how this stuff works. It's quite short. Um, and anyway, I thought it was really good. So if you want to just uh, look up Jens's YouTube and watch that, kind of gives you a nice introduction. Okay, so this is an example of what cross correlations look like. Um, like they said, they're used primarily for detections. So when you see a peak in this cross correlation, you know that the species is there. Um, so our goal was to say like, can you relate the shape or height of these CCFs to the atmospheric parameters? And we did this by running lots of cross correlations and building what we call CCF sequences. So essentially we just took a set of 64 different templates. Um, so we took four different species at four different temperatures and four different metallicities. And we ran the cross correlation um, for each of these templates with uh, all of our models. So we map each model into a set of cross correlations. And this is what one of them looks like. Um, I've just colored it by the um, species that's being cross correlated. But essentially the, the x-axis doesn't really mean anything because you're just putting these next to each other. I mean, officially it's the velocity, but only within the little um, the little bars. So we did that and we uh, mapped all the models in the training set onto these CCF sequences. And we did the same for the data. And this is what the testing stage looks like now. So a lot better. Um, for this, we generated a thousand models and then mapped them all to the CCF sequences using, uh, this is the same CCF that Jens talked about yesterday. Um, so here F is the uh, spectrum, T is the template, and then V is the velocity you're shifting by. And then we added noise to these to make more models out of them, um, which is pretty easy with the CCF. Oops. Um, because it's essentially just a linear combination of the points, um, you, can, you can propagate the noise very easily. Um, and then this is what you get for the testing stage. So you can see the temperature now looks really nice. It's following that red line closely, which is great. 
And the metal ST looks good up to a point. As you get to very high values, you have a degeneracy in the metal ST um, because as your metal ST increases, usually your spectral features are increasing. Um, but as you get very, very high levels, uh, you're no longer hydrogen dominated. So your mean molecular weight goes up really high, your scale height comes down, and then the features get muted again. So that's why you have this kind of curving effect. And then you've got lots of like all over the place predictions at high levels. So this is the retrieval on the actual Kelton-9b data. Um, so we ran a few different retrievals. Um, one of them uses the whole CCF sequence. So that's the full retrieval. And then we also tried like chopping it up into just the ions and just the neutral species um, to see like how that changes things. So um, if you look at the full retrieval, which is the lines, you can see that um, the temperature is being pushed up right against the prior, which is not great for a retrieval. Um, but when you compare it to the one where you just use the neutrals, you see it's also quite close to the prior, but at least you have more values. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the fit that it's trying to do to, for the CCF sequence, you can see that the model can't reach the levels of the data. Um, and that's because there's a lot, or we found a lot of ionized iron in this, um, in this planet. And that's really pushing the retrieval up to huge, like really extreme temperatures. Um, but that's just indicating that we're missing some physics in the model, or we don't really know what's going on on this planet. And again, you can see this by looking at the training set. So the gray shaded area covers the whole training set um, versus the data. And again, you can see here where FE plus is that um, it's really far away from the training set, which is generally a big no for machine learning. Um, but at least it can tell you that something weird is going on. And again, if you look at the feature importance, um, you see that for temperature, it's all being driven by this Fe plus. And this is not, um, the feature importance is not related to the data, it's just for the models. So ignoring the fact that you have loads of Fe plus in, in Kelt 9, um, for the models, Fe plus is telling you what the temperature is. And maybe it's a little bit intuitive as your temperature goes up, um, more of your species ionize and then you could use the abundance of those ionized species to tell you what the temperature is. Um, and then vice versa, you've got um, the neutrals telling you what the metallicity is. Okay. So a quick recap of how those high resolution retrievals work and what you need for them. Um, so you need to start with a grid of models or a code that you can use to create a grid of models. And this is what um, several people are going to talk about today. So we've got two lectures coming up about um, how to model spectra or specific codes you can use. Um, you also need templates for your species. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, and this is where things get a bit like confusing. So you need models, but you also need models of templates. And you can use the same model that you use to create, okay. You can use the same code that you use to make a model to make a template. Or you can get your templates from somewhere else. Uh, Jens mentioned yesterday, or I think on Slack, that there's a paper coming out soon, um, which is gonna provide templates. Um, but I think it's gonna be mostly ultraviolet Jupiters. And then you also need a way of doing the cross correlation. And you heard about that yesterday from Jens and Matteo. And then you need um, your random forest or favorite uh, method for comparing these. And that's where Hella comes in, which you can see on the GitHub or work through the CoLab. And you may also need some help, which is completely fair enough. Um, so I put my email address here and I think it's all on the website if you need. Okay, how am I doing for time? 10 minutes left. Okay, cool. I will keep going then. <clears throat> okay, so Sid already showed you the benefits of combining high and low resolution data. 
Um, and we're also looking at doing it, this with the forest um, because it's very easy to put these things together. You just kind of concatenate them onto the CCF sequences. Um, and then I think it's would be really cool to look at the feature importance to tell us which data set um, is driving the different parameters in your model. So maybe you'd expect that your high resolution data is going to tell you more about the temperature or perhaps the low resolution data is going to tell you about the water abundance. Uh, I think Sid already said that. So um, the forest gives you a really nice way of kind of quantifying that. Um, so that's where we're hoping to take this, but um, it's still in very, uh, what's the word, um, early stages. Okay. <coughs> so just very briefly, some other things you can do with the forest. Um, Maria Oroshenko had a paper last year which compares uh, grids of brown dwarf models by training on one set of models and testing on another. So several groups across the world um, generate their own model grids of brown dwarfs and they're quite happy to, to share those grids with you. So what Maria did was to train on one group's grid and test on another. And she found that um, for the temperature and gravity retrievals, there were some quite big differences between the grids. So, okay, the temperature looks fairly similar. There's a bit of an offset, um, but the gravity has a huge difference. And this is for a forest which is trained on Helios, which is Mathieu Malik's uh, radio transfer code, and then tested on Mark Marley's Sonora models. But then um, when she looked at the spectra themselves, she could see there's a huge difference in the way that they treat the alkali lines. And this is coming in at these uh, short wavelengths here. So you can see um, the spectra look really, really different here. So she tried cutting the spectra below 1.2 microns. And here she saw that um, when she did this, there's a really nice agreement between these temperature and also a pretty good agreement for gravity. Um, which is generally harder to, to retrieve. And then another um, project that we used the random forest for was um, looking at how to use James Webb to look at the chemistry of warm Neptunes. So Andrea Guzman Mesa um, used these predictability analysis and the feature importance to determine which mode of James Webb would be optimal for looking at the chemistry of these objects. And she found that um, the M4 mode, or what she calls the M4 mode, which is the G395M mode, I think, um, is best for if you want to know the C to O ratio. So, you know, working out the abundances of the molecules, which are important for that. Um, and she found that if you use the H4 mode, which is the high, higher resolution version, uh, you don't gain a lot. So this is kind of an example of how you can use the forest when you're like proposing for telescope time, or even if you wanted to um, propose for a new telescope, because it can really tell you like which wavelength ranges are best to look at um, and where to focus. Okay, I'm just gonna leave up the summary and maybe we can have questions or a bit of a discussion um, also with Sid, if people are interested. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Mateo, do you want to ask the question directly? Or is it just read? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was muted. Uh, <laughs> Chloe, right. basically, I'm going, I got inspired by Ever's previous question. Uh, when you were talking about combining high res and low res, you showed how you can concatenate essentially the, uh, um, the low res CCFs with the, sorry, the high res CCFs with the low res data. So I'm going to ask it even in this context, is, is it important that the dimensionality of the change side that you have roughly the same number of data points for the low res and the high, and the high res, or uh, does the algorithm automatically uh, weight for the information content and the dimensionality? Yeah, you should be weighted by the information content. That's actually kind of how it works. Um, <clears throat> so the way the feature importance works is it's just telling you like how high up in the tree, you split by that point. So maybe I can show you. 
Sorry, this looks really weird without the. Okay. So in this case, it would tell you that x1 is more important than x2 because it splits here first. Um, so it will just do the same thing. And in that way, you wait by the information content. So okay. in the low resolution spectra is telling you about water. When the tree is training, um, is looking for water, it's going to split by the low resolution stuff first. Um, so it should automatically wait. Um, and yeah, I don't think it's a problem that they have different dimensionality. Thanks. And we have time for the next uh, question. So Ever, the, do you want to ask uh, the question? Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering in practice, how reusable these uh, random forests really are? Because it seems our planets are incredibly diverse and we always want to have new models to run on them and they cover incredibly different parts of parameter space. So how often do you end up having to retrain a whole new model mm -hmm. to do a yeah. new retrieval and that ends up taking the same time <clears throat> as this? That's yeah. a good question. Um, so in practice, the way I do it at the moment is to start with quite specific training sets. So yeah, you would have to rerun it if you have a different planet, for example. Um, in theory, you could create some giant training set, which covers like huge, you know, parameter space. And we did talk about doing that. Um, and one of the ways you get around the kind of diversity is that you can use things like additional um, quantities like the radius or the gravity, and they would sit effectively like the spectral points as a way of splitting the trees. So it would automatically say like, you know, hot Jupiters go this way, super Earths go this way. Um, and you'd find that those parameters or those kind of points um, would sit very high in the trees, I think, because it would immediately be able to say, you know, the, the, the really large ones look very different from the, from the really small ones. Um, but obviously in practice, we haven't got round to creating you know, the ultimate training set yet. Um, <laughs> but it also doesn't take that long to run. Um, so for a low resolution retrieval, the training time is like five minutes. Um, for a high resolution retrieval, it's up to about an hour or so. Um, but once it's trained, each time you run it, it's very quick. So that's kind of one of the benefits. Um, the bottleneck is creating the training set which is of course also the bottleneck in a traditional retrieval. It's just that you do it on the fly. Um, so it's more a question of how fast your model is, or maybe you already have a set of models somewhere that you can use. Um, I think Daniel, Daniel Kitzman used his model to create a training set for us. And it took, um, I think it took him a weekend. He just set it off and, and came back and, um, but I think his uses GPUs to, speed up the process. So yeah, it varies a lot depending on, on how you're doing it. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe we can move on uh, to the next lecture.